Hello, and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com. You're also encouraged to join our pieville.net, and you can join our forum, <coughs> as well as read Daily Digest at kirksvilletoday.com. Today we're going to do Chapter 24 of 200 Years Together, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's History of Russian Jew Relations. Chapter 24 is called Breaking Away from Bolshevism. Last chapter we heard from the death of Stalin and the doctor's plot up to the, I think it was the Six Day War, and now we're moving beyond that. This will be about maybe 13 pages, starting on page uh, 728. Chapter 24, Breaking Away from Bolshevism. At the beginning of the 20th century, Europe imagined itself to be on the threshold of worldwide enlightenment. No one could have predicted the strength with which nationalism would explode in that very century among all nations of the world. One hundred years later, it seems nationalist feelings are not about to die soon. The very message that international socialists have been trying to drum into our heads for a whole century, that nationalism is dying out, but instead are gaining strength. Nationalism is... Yet, does not the multinational nature of humanity provide variety and wealth? Erosion of nations surely would be an impoverishment for humanity, the entropy of the spirit. And centuries of the histories of national cultures would then turn into irrede irredeemably dead and useless antics. The logic that it would be easier to manage such a uniform mankind fails by its petty reductionism. However, the propaganda in the Soviet Empire harped nonstop in an importunately triumphant manner about the imminent withering away and amalgamation of nations, proclaiming that, quote, no national question, unquote, exists in our country, and that there is certainly no, quote, Jewish question. Yet why should not the Jewish question exist, the question of the unprecedented 3,000-year-old existence of the nation, scattered all over the earth, yet spiritually soldered together despite all notions of the state and territoriality, and at the same time influencing the entire world history in the most lively and powerful way? Again, why is it a question and not a problem, given how they behave and have behaved during that entire period? Why should there not be a, quote, Jewish question, given that all national questions come up at one time or another, even the Gagau's question, a small Christian Turkic people who live in the Balkans in Eastern Europe, G-A-G-A-U-Z. Of course, no, silly such, no such silly doubt could ever arise if the Jewish question were not the focus of many different political games. The same was true for Russia, too. In pre-revolutionary Russian society, as we saw, it was the omission of the Jewish question that was committed, considered anti-Semitic, the omission of the Jewish question. In fact, in the mind of the Russian public, the Jewish question, understood as the question of civil rights or civil equality, developed into perhaps the central question of the whole Russian public life of that period, pre-revolution, should we give Jews full civil rights, full civil equality, and certainly into the central mode of the conscience of every individual, its acid test. Again, he's conservatively just simply going along with what is said, assuming that it's some great matter of import how Jews are treated by Russians rather than simply worrying about Russia. But if you worried about Russia, there wouldn't be a Jewish question. There would only be a problem. You know, in the same sense, if you have termites, you have a problem, or crickets, or rats. That's where you class the Jew thing, not as a question. And again here, you're tripped up by Christianity and the assumptions it brings and the particular lens through which it views the world. And you know it came from those very Jews. In fact, it's part of the Jewish question that is actually a Jewish problem is Christianity. I challenge you to look at it like that. With the growth of European socialism, all national issues were increasingly recognized as merely regrettable obstacles to that great doctrine. All the more was the Jewish question, directly attributed to capitalism by Marx, considered a bloated hindrance. Momsen, M-O-M-M-S-E-N, wrote that in the circles of Western Russian socialist Jewry, 
as he put it. Even the slightest attempt to discuss the Jewish question was branded as reactionary and anti-Semitic. This was even before the boon. Such was the, sta the iron standard of socialism inherited by the USSR. From 1918, the communists forbade, under threat of imprisonment or death, any separate treatment or consideration of the Jewish question, except sympathy for their suffering under the czars and positive attitudes for their active role in communism. The intellectual class voluntarily and willingly adhered to the new canon, while others were required to follow it. This cast of thought persisted even though the Soviet-German war, as if even then there was not any particular Jewish question. And even up to the demise of the USSR under Gorbachev, the authorities used to repeat hard-headedly, no, there is no Jewish question. No, no, no. It was replaced by the, quote, Zionist question. Yet already by the end of World War II, when the extent of the destruction of the Jews under Hitler had dawned on the Soviet Jews, and then through Stalin's, quote, anti-cosmopolitan campaign of the late 1940s, the socialist intelligentsia realized that the Jewish question in the USSR does exist, and the pre-revolutionary understanding that it is central to Russian society and to the conscience of every individual, and that it is the, quote, true measure of humanity, unquote, was also restored. How you treat the Jews is the measure of your humanity? I mean, this is absurd. Why is it never turned on the Jews? The measure of Judeanity is how they treat non-Jews, and they treat them as animals. They're only to serve Jews. In the West, it was only the leaders of Zionism who confidently talked from the late 19th century about the historical uniqueness and everlasting relevance of the Jewish question, and some of them at the same time maintained robust links with diehard European socialism. And then the emergence of the State of Israel and the consequent storms around it added to the confusion of, native social, of naive socialist minds of Europeans. Here I offer two small, but at the same time quite stirring and typical examples. In one episode of the so-called, quote, the dialogue between the East and West, unquote, show, a clever Cold War period program where Western debaters were opposed by Eastern European officials or novices who played off official nonsense for their own sincere convictions, in the beginning of 1967, a Slovak writer, Ladislav Monaco, M-N-A-C-K-O, Ladislav Monaco, properly representing the Socialist East, wittily noted that he never in his life had any conflict with the communist authorities, except one case when his driver's license was suspended for a traffic violation. His French opponent angrily said that at least in one other case, surely Monaco should be in the opposition when the uprising in neighboring Hungary was drowned in blood. But no, the suppression of Hungarian uprising neither violated the peace of Monaco's mind, nor did it force him to say anything sharp or impudent. Then, a few months passed after the dialogue and the Six-Day War broke out. At that point, the Czechoslovak government of Novotny, all loyal communists, accused Israel of aggression and severed diplomatic relations with it. And what happened next? Monaco, a Slovak married to a Jew, who had calmly disregarded the suppression of Hungary before, was now so outraged and agitated that he left his homeland and, as a protest, went to live in Israel. The second example comes from the same year. A famous socialist, Daniel Meyer, at the moment of the Six-Day War, had written in Le Monde that henceforth he is, one, ashamed to be a socialist in italics, because of the fact that the Soviet Union calls itself a socialist country, well, when the Soviet Union was exterminating not only its own people, but also other socialists, he was not ashamed when they were goyish socialists. Two, he's ashamed of being a French, obviously due to the wrong political position of de Gaulle. And three, ashamed to be a human, italics. Wasn't that too much? And ashamed of all except being a Jew. Well, that's par for the course, Daniel Meyer. Moving on to 730. We are ready to accept both Monaco's outrage and Meyer's anger, yet we would like to point out at the extreme intensity of their feelings, given the long history of their obsequious condoning of communism. Surely the intensity of their feelings is also an aspect of the Jew question in the 20th century. So in what way, quote, did the Jewish question 
not exist, close quote. If one listened to American radio broadcast aimed at the Soviet Union from 1950 to the 1980s, one might conclude that there was no other issue in the Soviet Union as important as the Jewish question, and that was true from here as well. At the same time in the U.S., where the Jews, quote, can be described as the most privileged minority, unquote, and where they, quote, gained an unprecedented status, the majority of American Jews still claim that hatred and discrimination by their Christian compatriots was a grim fact of modern life, unquote. Yet because it would sound incredible if stated aloud, then the Jewish question does not exist, and to notice it and talk about it is unnecessary and improper. We have to get used to talking about Jewish question, not only in hushed and fearful tones, but clearly articulately and firmly. We should do so not overflowing with passion, but sympathetically aware of both the unusual and difficult Jewish world history and centuries of our Russian history that are also full of significant suffering. And I'm completely wrong for reasons I've given that you should be able to figure out on your own. Then the mutual prejudices, sometimes very intense, would disappear and calm reason would reign. Yeah. Another pipe dream. He simply isn't interested in Jews and what they actually are because they've acted the same way in every single country and their own religious books. Isn't he supposed to be religious? Well, what are the Jews teaching themselves? What do they actually believe? Does their behavior line up with what they say in their own religious books? And unlike Christians, yes, it very much does. They're always hating every other people they live among and parasitize. Even when they're feeding off them, they hate them. So you're not going to get along. They have no interest in it. Working on this book, says Solzhenitsyn, I can't help but notice that the Jewish question has been omnipresent in world history, and it was never a national question in the narrow sense like all the other national questions, but was always, maybe because of the nature of Judaism, interwoven into something much bigger. I would like to take that as a hint that he's going to suddenly come to a realization, but the book's, you know, only got a few more chapters, and he is not a racialist. He is, doesn't even raise it to reject it. And then a new section. When in the late 1960s, I mused about the fate of the communist regime and felt that, yes, it is doomed, my impression was strongly supported by the observation that so many Jews had already abandoned it. His thinking in the 60s. He says, ah, this can't last forever. The Jews are already abandoning it, this communism. There was a period when they persistently and in unison supported the Soviet regime, and at that time the future definitely belonged to it. Yet now the Jews started to defect from it, first the thinking individuals and later the Jew masses, was this not a sign that the years of the Soviet rule are numbered? Yes, it was. So when exactly did it happen that the Jews, once such a reliable backbone of the regime, turned into almost its greatest adversary? Can we say that the Jews always struggled for freedom? No, for too many of them were the most zealous communists. Yet now they turn their backs on it. And without them, the aging Bolshevist fanaticism had not only lost some of its fervor, it actually ceased to be fanatical at all. Rather, it became lazy in the Russian way. And really, I, I don't know about you, but from reading this, and like I said, I have not read this before, Russians just come across as sort of sad sacks who are there to be bossed around by others, is my impression. Never having really particularly dealt with a lot of Russian people, lived around them or known them, certainly. After the Soviet-German War, the Jews became disappointed by communist power. It turned out they were worse off than before. We saw the main stages of this split. Initially, the support of the newborn state of Israel by the USSR had inspired the Soviet Jews. Then came the persecution of the Cosmopolitans and the mainly Jewish intelligentsia, not the Philistine masses yet, began to worry. Communism pushes the Jews aside? Oppresses them? The terrible threat of massacre by Stalin overwhelmed them as well, but it was short-lived and miraculously disappeared very soon. During the interregnum, followed by Stalin's death, and then under Khrushchev, Jewish hopes were replaced by dissatisfaction and the promised stable improvement failed to materialize. 
And then the Six-Day War broke out with truly biblical force, rocking both Soviet and world Jewry, and the Jewish national consciousness began to grow like an avalanche. After the Six-Day War, this is 1967, I believe, much was changed. The action required momentum. Letters and petitions began to flood Soviet and international organizations. National life was revived. During the holidays, it became difficult to get into a synagogue. Underground societies sprang up to study Jewish history, culture, and Hebrew. And then there was the rising campaign against Zionism, already linked to imperialism. He's quoting Zionism and imperialism. And so the resentment grew among the Jews toward that increasingly alien and abominable and dull Bolshevism. Where did such a monster come from? Indeed, for many educated Jews, the departure from communism was painful, as it is always difficult to part with an ideal. After all, it was not a, quote, great and perhaps inevitable planetary experiment initiated in Russia in 1917, an experiment based on ancient, attractive, and obviously high ideas, not all of which were faulty, and many still retain their beneficial effect to this day. Marxism requires educated minds, close quote. Many Jewish political writers strongly favored the term Stalinism, a convenient form to justify the earlier Soviet regime. It is difficult to part with the old familiar and sweet things if it really is possible at all. There have been attempts to increase the influence of intellectuals on the ruling elite. Such was the letter to the 23rd Congress of the Communist Party by G. Pomerantz, 1966. The letter asked the Communist Party to trust Quote, the scientific and creative intelligentsia, unquote, that, quote, desires not anarchy but the rule of law, that wants not to destroy the existing system but to make it more flexible, more rational, more humane, and proposed to establish an advisory think tank which would generally consult the executive leadership of the country. The offer remained unanswered and many souls long ached for such a wasted opportunity with such a, quote, glorious, unquote, past. But there was no longer any choice, and so the Soviet Jews split away from communism, and now, while deserting it, they turned against it, and that was such a perfect opportunity, they could themselves, with expurgatory repentance, acknowledge their formerly active and cruel role in the triumph of communism in Russia. Yet almost none of them did. I discussed a few exceptions below. They just uh, ignored what they had done to the Russians under communism, their communism, their Jewish communism, their Jewish Bolshevik revolution. Ignored what was done to whites. Because all they care about is what is good for Jews. And if that changes, they'll do a 180. They don't care about consistency. The above-mentioned collection of essays, Russia and the Jews, so heartfelt, so much needed and so timely when published in 1924, was fiercely denounced by Jewry. And even today, according to the opinion of the erudite scholar Shimon Markish, quote, these days nobody dares to defend those hook-nosed and burry commissars because of fear of being branded pro-Soviet, a Czechist, a God knows what else. Yet let me say in no uncertain terms, the behavior of those Jewish youths who joined the Reds is a thousand times more understandable than the reasons of the authors of that collection of works. Do Jews feel sorry for all the pain and misery they've imposed on others? The answer from history is emphatically not. Hate is a good thing in the Jewish cult, the Jewish religion. The Jewish criminality, Jewish genetic criminality. Still, some Jewish authors began to recognize certain things of the past as they really were, though in the most cautious terms. Quote, it was the end of the role of the Russian Jewish intelligentsia that developed in the pre-war and early post-war years, and that was, to some degree sincerely, a bearer of Marxist ideology that professed, however timidly and implicitly and contrary to actual practice, the ideals of liberalism, internationalism, and humanism. So we're going to judge them not by what they actually did, but by their idealism, supposed. A bearer of Marxist ideology? Yes, of course. The ideals of internationalism? Sure. Yet liberalism and humanism? True, but only after Stalin's death. 
while coming back to their senses. However, very different things can be inferred from the writings of the majority of Jewish publicists in the late Soviet Union. Looking back to the very year of 1917, they find that under communism there was nothing but Jewish suffering. Again, all, they always portray themselves as being victims, even if it was something that they did. They just end up, in the end, covering that up and claiming they were victims of someone else. Looking back to the very year of 1917, the year of the revolution, two revolutions, and October was the Jewish one, they find that under communism there was nothing but Jewish suffering. Quote, among the many nationalities of the Soviet Union, the Jews have always been stigmatized as the least reliable element. What incredibly short memory one should have to state such things in 1983, says Solzhenitsyn. Always. But what about the 20s and the 30s? To assert that they were then considered the least reliable? Is it really possible to forget everything so completely? But of course they're not forgetting, they're lying. The guy is naive. And if he's not naive, it, what, what, what is to be gained by pretending that they're forgetting rather than just simply stating that they're scummy liars? Middle 732 we're on, quote, If one takes a bird's eye view of the entire history of the Soviet era, then the latter appears as one gradual process of destruction of the Jews. Note, the entire history. We investigated this in the previous chapters and saw that even without taking into account Jewish overrepresentation in the top Soviet circles, there had been a period of well-being for many Jews, with mass migration of the cities, open access to higher education, and the blossoming of Jewish culture. Yes, we've talked about all that. That's, these are some of the key things you want to take away. That Jews ran to the cities and took over much of the administration, the day-to-day -day bureaucracy of dealing with the mass of the Russian population by the communists. Those positions were taken over by Jews. That's really what you want to take away from it. And now here, 80 years later, they're all lying about it, how it, it afflicted them worse than anybody. In fact, they had it best, better than everybody. They were not the ones in the bread lines. They were the nepotist in the offices doing the easy work. The author proceeds without, with a reservation. Although there were certain fluctuations, the overall trend continued. Soviet power, destroying all nationalities, generally dealt with the Jews in the most brutal way. So just flat lying, as Jews always do. If lying is not a racial characteristic, I, I don't see how anyone could deny that it is. They, uh, they lie about everything, essentially, all the time. Another author considers a disaster even the early period when Lenin and the Communist Party called upon the Jews to help with state governance, and the call was heard, and the great masses of Jews from the shtetls of the hated pale moved into the capital and the big cities, closer to the avant-garde of the revolution. He states that, quote, the formation of the Bolshevik regime that had turned the greater part of Jews into déclassé, impoverished and exiled them and destroyed their families, unquote, was a catastrophe for the majority of the Jewish population, says Solzhenitsyn. Well, that depends on one's point of view. And the author himself later notes, in the 20s and 30s, the Quote, children of de classe, Jewish petty bourgeois, were able to graduate from the technical institutes and metropolitan universities and to become commanders of the great developments. Close quote. Remember, they were not discriminated against. The native Russians were as bourgeois. They were exempt from being considered bourgeois since officially they're, they're doing a class war thing. But in reality, it's a racial war. Then his reasoning becomes vague. Quote, in the beginning of the century, the main feature of Jewish activity was a fascination with the idea of building a new, fair society. Yet the army of revolution, quote, consisted of plain rabble, all those who were, were nothing. A quote from the International, their song, their communist international song. Then, quote, after the consolidation of the regime, that rabble, quote, decided to implement their motto and to become all. Also a quote from the International and finished off their own leaders. And so the kingdom of rabble, unlimited totalitarianism, was established. Close quote. And in this context, the Jews had nothing to do with it except that they were among the victimized leaders. 
and the purge continued, quote, for four decades, unquote, until the mid-1950s, then the last bitter pill, according to the scenario of disappointments, was prescribed to the remaining, quote, charmed Jews, unquote. Again, we see the same angles, says Solzhenitsyn. The entire Soviet history was one of unending oppression and exclusion of the Jews. So far from being what they inflicted on Goyim, they were the victims of their own Sovietism. Yet they now wail in protest in unison, we did not elect this regime. Or even, quote, it is not possible to cultivate a loyal Soviet elite among them, the Jews. Oh my God, was not this method working flawlessly for 30 years and only later coming undone? So where did all those glorious and famous names whom we've seen in such numbers come from? And why were their eyes kept so tightly shut that they couldn't see the essence of Soviet rule for 30 to 40 years? Of course they could, they're lying. How is it that their eyes were opened only now, and what opened them? Well, it was mostly because of the fact that now that power had suddenly turned around and began pushing the Jews, not only out of its ruling and administrative circles, but out of cultural and scientific establishments also. Quote, the disappointment was so fresh and sore that we did not have the strength nor the courage to tell even our children about it. And what about the children? For the great majority of them, the main motivation was the same, graduate school, career, and so on. Yet soon they would have to examine their situation more closely. New section. In the 1970s, we see examples of rather amazing agreement of opinions unthinkable for the past half a century. For instance, Shulgin wrote in 1929, We must acknowledge our past. The flat denial, claiming that the Jews are to blame for nothing, neither for the Russian Revolution nor for the consolidation of Bolshevism, nor for the horrors of communism, is the worst way possible. It would be a great step forward if this groundless tendency to blame all the troubles of Russia on the Jews could be somewhat differentiated. It would be already great if any contrasts could be found. Close quote. Shulgin, S-H-U-L-G-I-N. Fortunately, such contrasts and even more comprehension and even remorse were vo voiced by some Jews. Now he's going to do a shtick where he drags up the one or two that, are, that prove that the 98 don't exist, if we're to use Catholic reasoning. And this brings hope. Not to me it doesn't. Not to anyone sane. Here's Dan Levin, American intellectual who immigrated to Israel. Quote, It is no accident that none of the American writers who attempted to describe and explain what happened to Soviet Jewry has touched this important issue, the Jewish responsibility for communism. In Russia, the people's anti-Semitism is largely due to the fact that the Russians perceive the Jews as the cause of all the evil of the revolution. Yet American writers, Jews and ex-communists, do not want to resurrect the ghosts of the past. Yeah, like they have a lot of trouble resurrecting uh, Hitler for defending whites. However, oblivion is a terrible thing. I noticed here, he, sa he says basically the Russians are just a bunch of lazy people. Well, being lazy and not taking advantage of opportunities open to you is exactly how you get Jews on top of yourself in your, in your country. So you have to absolutely seize, whether it's stuff like Bitcoin or the chance to become more educated, you have to seize that and take advantage of it. If you're going to be a lazy peasant or lazy in any way, you're not going to uh, win and you are going to be dominated by others. And if you don't like that, that's nature. Simultaneously, another Jewish writer an emigre from the Soviet Union, published the experience of the Russian Soviet Jewry in contrast with that of the European Jewry, whose historical background, quote, is the experience of a collision with the forces of outer evil, requires a look not from inside out, but rather of introspection and inner self-examination, unquote. Quote, in this reality, we saw only one Jewish spirituality, that of the Commissar, and its name was Marxism. Or he writes about, quote, our young Zionist who demonstrates so much contempt toward Russia, her rudeness and savagery, contrasting all this with the worthiness of the ancient Jewish nation. Quote, I saw pretty clearly that those today who sing hosannas to Jewry, glorifying it in its entirety without the slightest sense of guilt or the slightest potential to look inside, yesterday were saying, I wouldn't be against the Soviet regime if it was not anti-Semitic. 
and two days ago they beat their breast in ecstasy. Long live the great brotherhood of nations. Eternal glory to the father and friend, the genius comrade Stalin. But today, when it is clear how many Jews were in the iron Bolshevik leadership, and how many more took part in the ideological guidance of a great country to the wrong track, should the question not arise among modern Jews as to some sense of responsibility for the actions of those Jews? It should be asked in general, shouldn't there be a kind of moral responsibility, not a joint liability, yet the responsibility to remember and to acknowledge what you vile Jews have done to our great Russian nation? For example, modern Germans accept liability to Jews directly, both morally and materially, as perpetrators are liable to the victims. For many years they have paid compensation to Israel and personal compensation to surviving victims. Yet we all know the truth about all that, that it won't bear looking into. They were not victims. The Germans were defending themselves. They have no duty of any kind to Jews other than to drive them completely out of their country and out of their continent. So what about Jews? When Mikhail Kaifetz, whom I repeatedly cite in this work, after having been through labor camps, expressed the grandeur of his character by repenting on behalf of his people for the evil committed by Jews in the Soviet Union in the name of communism, he was bitterly ridiculed. Mikhail Kaifetz, K-H-E-I-F-E-T-S, I'm sure you've never heard of him. I certainly have not. He repented on behalf of the evil committed by Jews in the USSR in the name of communism, Mikhail Kaifetz. The whole edu he was bitterly ridiculed. The whole educated society, the cultured circle, had genuinely failed to notice any Russian grievances in the 1920s and 30s. Here again, he's weakened because he doesn't know what a Jew is. He thinks it's just some nation. He doesn't, you know, there's Latvians, there's Lithuanians, there's Tatars, but they're not living by this code of hating all other people and wanting to kill them and, and considering them animals. He never takes any of that into account. He's just acting like Jews are individuals who could be bad or good. For some reason, they all choose to be bad all the time. And then he's got to dig and dig and dig like a Catholic to find the one example out of a thousand that disproves the 999. They didn't even assume that such could exist. Russian grievances, like the Russians have anything to complain about. Yet they instantly recognized the Jewish grievances as soon as those emerged. Take, for example, Victor Perlman, who after emigrating published an anti-Soviet jour Jewish journal, Epic and We, and who served the regime in the filthiest place. In Tchaikovsky's Literaturnaya Gazeta, Literaturnaya Gazeta, until the Jewish question had entered his life, then he opted out. At a higher level, they generalized it as the crash of illusions about the integration of Jewry into Russian social movements, about making any change in Russia. Thus, as soon as the Jews recognized their explicit antagonism to the Soviet regime, they turned into its intellectual opposition, in accord to their social role. Of course, it was not them who rioted in Novo Cherkask, or created unrest in Krasnodar, Alexandrov, Muram, or Kostroma, yet the filmmaker Mikhail Rom, R-O-M-M, -M, plucked up his heart and, during a public speech, unambiguously denounced the, quote, anti-cosmopolitan, unquote, campaign, and that became one of the first Samzadat documents, and Rom himself, who in so timely a manner rid himself of his ideological impediments, became a kind of spiritual leader for the Soviet Jewry, despite his films, Lenin in October 1937, Lenin in 1918 and 1939, and despite being a fivefold winner of the Stalin Prize. And after that, the Jews had become reliable supporters and intrepid members of the, quote, democratic, unquote, and, quote, dissident, unquote, movements. Jews always do what's good for Jews. On to 735, looking back from Israel at the din of Moscow, another witness reflected, quote, a large part of Russian Democrats, if not the majority, are of Jewish origin, yet they do not identify themselves as Jews and do not realize that their audience is also mostly Jewish. And so the Jews had once again become the Russian revolutionaries. 
shouldering the social duty of the Russian intelligentsia, which the Jewish Bolsheviks so zealously helped to exterminate during the first decade after the revolution. They had become the true and genuine nucleus of the new public opposition. And so yet again, no progressive movement was possible without Jews. Now they're, first they're the communist under the Tsar, now they're the anti bolshevik now they're the anti Stalinites and the anti Soviets under communism. Who had halted the torrent? Now they've killed Russia's native head, or it's called intelligentsia, even in English. We took that word from Russian. In Russia, it's with a Y A at the end, which is a backwards R is pronounced Y A. So they killed the Russian head and replaced it with a Jew, Jew head. Now there's two Jew heads. Who had halted the torrent of false political and often semi-closed court trials? Alexander Ginsburg and then Pavel Litvinov, Litvinov and then Larisa Bogoraz did. I would not exaggerate if I claim that their appeal, quote, to world public opinion in January 1968, delivered not through unreliable samzadat, that is, underground publications, but handed fearlessly to the West in front of Cheka cameras, had been a milestone of Soviet ideological history. Who were those brev seven brave souls who dragged their leaden feet to Lobo Labnoye Mesto, a stone platform in Red Square, on August 25, 1968? They did it not for the greater success of their protest, but to wash the name of Russia from the Czechoslovak disgrace by their sacrifice. Four out of the seven were Jews. Remember that the percentage of Jews in the population of the country was less than 1%. We should also remember Semyon Gluzman, G-L-U-Z-M-A-N, who sacrificed his freedom in the struggle against the nuthouses, quote-unquote. Dissidents were sometimes incarcerated in psychiatric hospitals or clinics. Many Jewish intellectuals from Moscow were among the first punished by the Soviet regime. Yet very few dissidents ever regretted the past of their Jewish fathers. P. Litvinov never mentioned his grandfather's role in Soviet propaganda. Neither would we hear from V. berlat Tsarkovsky how many innocents were slaughtered by his Mauser-toting father. Communist Raisa Lert, L-E-R-T, who became a dissident later in life, was proud of her membership in that party. Even after the Gulag Archipelago, the party, quote, she had joined in good faith and enthusiastically, unquote, in her youth, the party to which she had, quote, wholly devoted herself, unquote, and from which she had herself suffered, yet nowadays it is, quote, not the same, unquote, party anymore. Apparently she did not realize how appealing early Soviet terror was for her. After the events of 1968, Sakharov joined the dissident movement without a backward glance. Among his new dissident preoccupations were many individual cases, in particular personal cases of Jewish refuseniks, those overwhelming Jewish, overwhelmingly Jewish dissidents who requested but were refused the right to emigrate from the Soviet Union. Yet when he tried to expand the business, as he had innocently confided to me, not realizing all the glaring significance of what he said, Gelfand, a member of the Academy of Science, told him that, quote, we are tired of helping these people to resolve their problems, while another member, Zeldovich, said, quote, I'm not going to sign any petition on behalf of victims of any injustice. I want to retain the ability to protect those who suffer for their nationality, unquote, which means to protect the Jews only. There was also a purely Jewish dissident movement, which was concerned only with the oppression of the Jews and Jewish emigration from the Soviet Union. More about it later. New section as we move on to 736. A transformation in public consciousness often pushes forward outstanding individuals as representatives, symbols, and spokesmen of the age. So in the 1960s, Alexander Gaelic became such a typical and accurate representative of the processes and attitudes in the Soviet intellectual circles. Gaelic is a pen name, explains Anne Rubinstein. It is made of syllables of his real name, Ginsburg Alexander Arkadievich. Gaelic, G-A-L-I-C-H, is the acronym made from that. Choosing a pen name is a serious thing. Actually, I assume the author was aware that, apart from being, quote, just a combination of syllables, Galich is also the name of an ancient Russian city from the very heart of Slavic history, 
Galich enjoyed the general support of Soviet intelligentsia. Tape recordings of his guitar performances were widely disseminated, and they have almost become the symbol of the social revival of the 1960s, expressing it powerfully and vehemently. The opinion of the cultural circle was unanimous. The most popular people's poet, the, quote, bard of modern Russia. Galich was 22 when the Soviet-German war broke out. He says that he was exempt from military service because of poor health. He then moved to Grozny, where he, quote, unexpectedly easily became the head of the literature section of the local drama theater. He also, quote, organized a theater of political satire. Then he evacuated through Krasnovodsky to Chirchik near Tashkent. In 1942, he moved from there to Moscow with a frontline theatrical company under formation and spent the rest of the war with that company. He recalled how he worked on hospital trains, composing and performing couplets for wounded soldiers, how they were drinking spirits with a train master. Quote, All of us, each in his own way, worked for the great common cause. We were defending our motherland. After the war, he became a well-known Soviet scriptwriter. He worked on many movies and a playwright. Ten of his plays were staged by, quote, many theaters in the Soviet Union and abroad. All that was in the 1940s and 50s, in the age of general spiritual stagnation. Well, he could not step out of line, could he? He even made a movie about Czechists and was awarded for his work. Yet in the early 1960s, Galich abruptly changed his life. He found courage to forsake his successful and well-off life and, quote, walk into the square, unquote. It was after that that he began performing guitar-accompanied songs to people gathering in private Moscow apartments. He gave up open publishing, though. It was, of course, not easy. It was great to read a name on the cover, not just someone else's, but mine. Surely his anti-regime songs, keen, acidic, and morally demanding, were of benefit to the society, further destabilizing public attitudes. In his songs, he mainly addressed Stalin's later years and beyond. He usually did not deplore the radiant past of the age of Lenin, except one instance, quote, the carts with bloody cargo squeak by Nikitsky gate. At his best, he calls the society to moral cleansing, to resistance. Quote, gold diggers waltz. Quote, I choose liberty. Quote, ballad of the clean hands. Quote, our fingers blotted from the questionnaires. Quote, every day silent trumpets glorify thoughtful vacuity. Sometimes he sang the hard truth about the past. Quote, in vain had our infantry perished in 1943, to no avail. Sometimes, quote, red myths, singing about poor persecuted communists. Quote, there was a time, almost a third of the inmates came from the Central Committee. There was a time when, for the red color, they added ten years to the sentence, close quote. Once he touched deep cool accusation, quote, disenfranchised ones were summoned in first, Yet his main blow was against the current establishment. Quote, there are fences in the country. Behind fences live the leaders. He was justly harsh there. However, he oversimplified the charge by attacking their privileged way of life only. Here they eat, drink, rejoice. The songs were embittering, but in a narrow-minded way, almost like the primitive red proletarian propaganda of the past. Yet when he was switching his focus from the leaders to the people, his characters were almost entirely boobies, fastidious men, rabble and rascals, a very limited selection. He had found a precise point of perspective for himself, perfectly in accord with the spirit of the time. He impersonalized himself with all those people who were suffering, persecuted, and killed. Quote, I was a G.I., and as a G.I., I'll die. Quote, we G.I.s are dying in battle. Yet with his many songs narrated from the first person of a former camp inmate, he made a strong impression that he was an inmate himself. Quote, and that other inmate was me myself, unquote. Quote, I froze like a horseshoe in a sleigh trail, into ice that I picked with a hammer pick. After all, wasn't it me who spent 20 years in those camps? Quote, as the numbers of personal inmate tat number tattooed in the arm, we died, we died. From the camp, we were sent right to the front. Many believe that he was a former camp inmate, and, quote, they have been trying to find from Gaelic when and where he had been in the camps. 
So how did he address his past, his long-standing participation in the stupefying official Soviet lies? That's what had struck me the most, says Solzhenitsyn. Singing with such accusatory pathos, he had never expressed a single word of his personal remorse. Not a word of personal repentance, nowhere, all in italics. Almost like Jews aren't like other people. He never seems to consider that. Didn't he realize when he sang about, oh, party's Iliad, what a gift wrap groveling, he sang about himself? And when he crooned, if you sell the unction, as though referring to somebody else, did it occur to him that he himself was selling the unction for half of his life? Why on earth would he not renounce his pro-official plays and films? No, quote, we did not sing glory to executioners, unquote. Yet, as a matter of fact, they did. Perhaps he did, did realize it, or gradually came to the realization, because later, no longer in Russia, he said, quote, I was a well-off screenwriter and playwright and a well-off Soviet flunky, and I have realized that I could no longer go on like that. Finally, I have to speak loudly, speak the truth. Of course, it's just Jews lying. But then in the 60s, he intrepidly turned the pathos of the civil rage, for instance, to the refutation of the gospel commandments. Quote, do not judge lest ye be judged. Quote, no, I have contempt for the very essence of this formula of existence. And then relying on the sung miseries, he confidently tried on a prosecutor's robe. Quote, I was not elected, but I am the judge. And he grew so confident that in the lengthy poem about Stalin, The Legend of Christmas, where he in bad taste imagined Stalin as Christ and presented the key formula of his agnostic mindset, his really famous, the cliched quotes, and so harmful lines, quote, Don't be afraid of fire and hell, and fear only him who says, I know the right way, close quote. Says Solzhenitsyn, but Christ did teach us the right way, says he. I say the opposite. What we see here in Gaelic's, Gaelic's words is just boundless intellectual anarchism that muzzles any clear idea any resolute offer, well, we can always run as a thoughtless but pluralistic herd and probably will get somewhere. Yet the most heartrending and ubiquitous keynote in his lyrics was the sense of Jewish identity and Jewish pain. Quote, Our train leaves for Auschwitz today and daily. Other good examples include the poems By the Rivers of Babylon and Kadesh, or t like Allen Ginsberg, or take this, my six-pointed star, burn it on my sleeve and on my chest. Similar lyrical and passionate tones can be found in The Memory of Odessa. Quote, I wanted to unite Mandelstam and Chagall. Quote, your kinsman and your cast off, your last singer of the Exodus, as he addressed the departing Jews. The Jewish memory imbued him so deeply that even in his non-Jewish lyrics, he casually added expressions such as, quote, not a hook-nosed, quote, not a Tatar, not a Yid, quote, you are still not in Israel, daughterer. And even Arina Rodionovna, Pushkin's nanny, immortalized by the poet in his works, lulls him in Yiddish. Yet he doesn't mention a single prosperous or non-oppressed Jew, a well-off Jew in a good position, for instance, in a research institute, editorial board, or in commerce. Such characters didn't even make a passing appearance in his poems. A Jew is always either humiliated or suffering or imprisoned or dying in a camp. Take his famous lines. You are not to be chamberlains, the Jews. Neither the Synod nor the Senate is for you. You belong in Solovaki, Solovki and Butyrki, the latter two being political prisons. Solovki and Butyrki, B-U-T-Y-R-K-I and S-L-O-O-V. S-O-L-O-V-K-I and Butyrki. What a short memory they have. Again, they're lying. They're lying. That's all it is. There's nothing complicated. They're not forgetting. They're not misemphasizing. They are simply lying. They all do it. It's a racial thing. What a short memory they have, says Solzhenitsyn, persisting in his Christian error, implicitly and sometimes explicitly. Not only Galich, but his whole audience, who are sincerely, heartily taking in these sentimental lines. 
What about those 20 years when Soviet Jewry was not nearly in Solovki, when so many of them did parade as Chamberlains and in the Senate? They have forgotten. Bullshit, they have forgotten it. They're lying. They have sincerely and completely forgotten it. Nope, 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 nope. Indeed, it is so difficult to remember bad things about yourself. No, it's not hard at all. They absolutely know about it. And inasmuch as among the successful people milking the regime, there were supposedly no Jews left, but only Russians. Galich's satire unconsciously or consciously hit the Russians, all those Klim Petroviches and Paramanovs, all that social anger invoked by his songs targeted them through the stressed Russo Russo Piatti, derogatory term for Russians, images and details, presenting them as informers, prison guards, profligates, fools, or drunks. Sometimes it was more like a caricature, sometimes more of a contemptuous pity, which we often indeed deserve, unfortunately. Quote, greasy hair, greasy long hair hanging down. The guest started Yermak, a song about the Cossack leader and Russian folk hero, Y-E-R-M-A-K, he cackles like a cock, enough to make a preacher swear, and he wants to chat about the salvation of Russia. Thus he pictured the Russians as always drunk, not distinguishing kerosene from vodka, not interested in anything except drinking, idle or simply lost, or foolish individuals. Yet he was considered a folk poet, folk in italics, Jew pretending to speak for the community. And he didn't image a single Russian hero soldier, workman, or intellectual, not even a single decent camp inmate. He assigned the role of the main camp inmate to himself, because, you know, all those, quote, prison guards seed, unquote, camp bosses are Russians. And here he wrote about Russia directly, quote, every liar is a messiah. And just to dare you to ask, brothers, had there ever been any Rus in Russia? It is a brim with filth. And then, desperately, quote, But somewhere, perhaps, she does exist. That invisible Russia where, under the tender skies, everyone shares God's word and bread. I pray thee, hold on, be alive and decay. So in the heart as in Kits, Kitez, Kitej, I could hear your bells. So with the new opportunity and the lure of emigration, Galich was torn between the submerged legendary Kitzej, Kitej, K-I-T-E-Z-H, legendary Russian invisible city. Galich was torn between the submerged leg legendary Kitej, legendary Russian invisible city, and today's filth. Quote, it's the same vicious circle, the same old story, the ring, which cannot be either closed or open. He left with the words, I, a Russian poet, cannot be separated from Russia by the fifth article, the requirement in the Soviet internal passport for nationality. Yet some other departing Jews drew from his songs a seed of aversion and contempt for Russia, or at least the confidence that it is right to break away from her. Heed a voice from Israel. Quote, we said goodbye to Russia, not without pain, but forever. Russia still holds us tenaciously, but in a year, ten years, a hundred years, we'll escape from her and find our own home. Listening to Galich, we once again recognize that it is the right way. Jesus Christ, the Jews themselves have to throw themselves out of Russia, and the Russians still can't figure out that's the best thing that could possibly happen to them is getting rid. If you can't get them underground, at least get them far, far away as possible. Which, after all, is all Hitler had tried to do, though he should have tried more. It's easy to judge after the fact. And again, most of the Jews had emigrated, and there wasn't anything he could do about them. They weren't under his control. But Jews have to be treated the way termites are. If we exterminate termites because they wreck the foundations of our houses, symbolically, foundations are mostly concrete. They're not going to eat the concrete, but you get the point. How much more lenient should we be with Jews who wreck the foundations of our nation? There is no answer to that but the one I have given you. And this, this Christian half-wits, I'm just not going to treat with respect people I don't respect. It's that simple.
Um, this is not a joke. This is very, very high stakes determinations that are being considered here. And I can't tell you, I can tell you what I think. I can't tell you what you should think, but you've got to come to some conclusion about what a Jew is and what must be done to it if you value your white kind. If you don't value being white, if you're happy being essentially a slave in a Jew system where your money is stolen from you by taxes and you're abused in the media and you're discriminated against everywhere and you can't really have any solid foundation for anything because it can be stripped away at any time, no matter what the law says, then I guess you don't have any problem with any of this. But if you do have a problem with that, what will provide that stability other than a white racial state? That means there are no non-whites, let alone any Jews, in that white racial state. And race is the basis of that state. Now, is it not clear to you as to me that if Russia had only Russians in it, and not Jews, it would be a lot better off. And what nation is that not true for? I've been Alex Linder reading to you out of Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together. This was chapter 24, and I believe it was recording number 37. And it will be permanently archived as you know, at vnnforum.com. Thanks for being with me today, and I'll be back with you for more from Solzhenitsyn. We've just got a few more chapters to go real, real soon.